Good morning, YouTubers. From the beginning of this series, I've discussed several game developers who have used various tactics to get around Nintendo's lockout chip to release unlicensed games. One of the developers who I kept briefly mentioning was Tengen. In fact, it doesn't even have the familiar Tengen black cartridge. I already discussed Color Dreams in a previous episode, and I'll be covering Tengen in a later one. Companies such as Color Dreams, Comerica, and Tengen began bypassing Nintendo's lockout chip in one way or another. If you're wondering why I didn't go into more detail about Tengen when I covered the others, was because Tengen's story needed more explanation than just a few minutes clumped together with the other developers. If you haven't watched my previous videos on Color Dreams, Kalub, or Mystique, I invite you to do so. However, the Mystique episode contains adult content and is not safe for work. First off, the pronunciation. Is it Tengen or Tengen? My answer is potato, potato. Following the video game crash of 1983, which resulted in the downfall of Atari and their dominance of the home gaming market, Nintendo emerged from the ashes when they released their 8-bit system in 1985. Nintendo maintained strict control over their console and wanted to ensure they didn't suffer the same fate that Atari had just a couple of years earlier. To do this, Nintendo installed a lockout chip that prevented cartridges without the key from working. They also prohibited companies from developing and releasing more than five games a year, and any released games needed to go through their strict quality control process that kept games of poor quality from being released. They also required developers to pay a fee for every game they made. While these practices were understandable, considering Atari did not do any of this and it resulted in many identical or pornographic games, many companies wanted Nintendo to loosen up the restrictions of only releasing five games a year. Other companies felt the quality control process was also too excessive. This resulted in numerous companies working to get around the lockout chip. Some were successful at this and released several unlicensed games. The lockout chip works much like an encryption code does for your phone, but there is one developer who made a bold move against Nintendo. That developer was Tengen. But who exactly is Tengen and what exactly did they do? Tengen was formed in 1987 and was actually a subsidiary of Atari? Are you serious? Atari! The company that once was synonymous with video games before Nintendo had broken out onto the scene? Yes, that Atari. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. After Atari lost over half a billion dollars in 1983, that's billion with a B, Warner Communications, who owned Atari, sold the company to Jack Trammell. Trammell had started Commodore International, the creator of the Commodore line of computers. While at Commodore, Trammell was described as a micromanager and was involved in every decision the company made, especially if that decision cost $1,000 or more. After a board meeting in January of 1984, Trammell left the company on what is described as bad terms. The exact reason for his departure remains unclear, but those involved say there was a disagreement between Trammell and Commodore board chair Irving Gould. Trammell would only say he and Gould disagreed about the basic principles of how to run a company. But considering Commodore International had grown into a billion dollar company by this time, Trammell wasn't sitting on a sidewalk with a cup in his hand. Soon after, Jack Trammell formed Trammell Technology Limited. And no, that's not a typo, Trammell spelled the new company name differently so that people wouldn't mispronounce it. In July of 1984, Trammell bought the consumer division of Atari, renaming his company Atari Corporation. They entered the market with the intention of competing against Apple in the computer business. In 1985, the Atari ST was released and actually became quite successful, especially in Europe. When Trammell had acquired Atari in 1984, he didn't acquire the entire company. Warner Communications kept the coin-operate portion of Atari, renaming it Atari Games. As part of the agreement between Trammell and Warner, Trammell could use the Atari brand name with his company and products, and Warner could continue to use the Atari brand as well, but only as Atari Games. The word Games was required to be in front of any product Warner released as Atari, and Atari Games was not allowed to enter the home market. They had to stay with their coin operating machines in the arcade market. By 1985, Atari Games had been sold to the Japanese company Namco, but soon after, the American employees bought out Namco's shares. This is where things get interesting. After the employees took control of Atari games, they not only continued their work in the arcade market, but in 1987 expanded to the home market by developing games for Nintendo. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. I thought the deal with Trammell's Atari was that Atari games had to stay out of the home market. Well, while it did specify that, what the fine print of the contract actually said was that they couldn't enter the home gaming market under the Atari brand. There was a loophole that allowed Atari games to do this but first they needed a new name. 
And to do this, they went back to their roots with how Atari originally got its name. Atari's name comes from the Japanese board game Go, with the word Atari being a position in the game when a group of stones is imminently in danger of being taken by one's opponent. Kind of like saying check in chess. Tenken is the word that referenced the center of the board for the same game. So, Atari Games created a subsidiary called Tengen, and they actually made deals with their former owners at Namco to port some of their Japanese computer games over to the American market. The company Sunsoft also got on board, hoping to make a splash in the American market as well. Feeling confident, Tengen hoped they could negotiate with Nintendo to loosening up their licensing restrictions. They were unsuccessful, but in December of 1987, they did agree to a standard licensing contract with Nintendo. By 1988, Tengen released their only three official games for Nintendo, Pac-Man, RBI Baseball, and Gauntlet. At the same time, Tengen was actively working to bypass the lockout chip Nintendo installed in all their games. After being unable to successfully reverse engineer it, they floated several ideas of how they could deactivate it. One idea involved sending a spike of voltage to the chip, a method that proved successful with other companies, but Tengen was worried that method might damage the consoles and subject them to liability suits. What Tengen ended up doing seems like it belongs in a Monty Python sketch. Who would cross the bridge of death must answer me these questions three. Eh, the other side he see. Ask me the questions, bridge keeper. I am not afraid. What is your name? My name is Sir Lancelot of Camelot. What is your quest? To seek the Holy Grail. What is your favorite color? Blue. Right, off you go. Oh, thank you. Tengen told the patent office that they had filed a lawsuit against Nintendo, claiming Nintendo had violated their copyrights to the lockout chip they were using. But in reality, no lawsuit was actually filed, nor had they ever planned on doing so. That's right. Tengen told the patent office that they had actually invented the lockout chip and that Nintendo stole the technology. Now, the fact that all that was bogus didn't stop the U.S. Patent Office from just handing Nintendo's patent over to Tengen. And honestly, it was that simple. Tengen's lawyers contacted the Copyright Office, explaining they needed the patent to compare it to theirs in the lawsuit, and the Copyright Office complied. And just like that, Tengen had the secret to Nintendo's lockout chip in their hands. Tengen named their clone chip the Rabbit. Upon releasing a collection of unlicensed games, Nintendo sued Tengen for the exact same thing Tengen fictionally sued them for, copyright and patent infringement. Before I go any further on what happened in the courts regarding Tengen and Nintendo, I have to discuss a couple of lawsuits related to the court's decision. By the early 1980s, numerous companies emerged, hoping to take a piece of the Silicon Valley pie that seemed like was infinitely growing in the computer market. One such company, Computer Associates Technologies, or CA Technologies, formed in 1976 and began writing software for IBM-compatible computers. One of these programs was a job scheduling program that was designed to sort, run, and control various tasks of the computer, much like an operating system. This specific program was written for IBM System 370 compatible computers. The IBM System 370 could run any one of several operating systems, which included MVS, VMCMS, or DOS VSE. Before Microsoft and Apple became the two dominant operating systems used by the world today, sorry Linux, you're awesome, but kids don't beg their parents to buy a computer that runs Linux. Before Microsoft and Apple became the two dominant operating systems used by the world today, there hadn't been a single dominant operating system. So software was only compatible with whichever system was written for. Which is still technically the case, but at least now there's only Apple and Microsoft. Sorry Linux, you can go back to your Chromebook now. In the early 1980s, there were many different operating systems as there were computers. And so programming software meant coding it for one specific program. To combat this problem of rewriting new software every time for every new system, CA Technologies developed an adapter component for automatically converting software from one operating system to another, conveniently named Adapter. Now the adapter component was only able to translate the program code into one of the three previously mentioned operating systems, MVS, VMCMS, or DOS VSE. But the idea was certainly great and the component was better than nothing. This allowed the software's programmer to only write a single program of code for the software, thereby making it marketable to users of multiple operating systems. In 1982, Claude Arney, a computer programmer working for CA Technologies at the time, accepted a job offer from a close friend of his at another computer company, Altai. After leaving CA Technologies and joining Altai, Arney began to work on a job scheduler program for the VSC operating system called Zeek. Within a year, Zeek had become a highly successful program and there suddenly was demand for it in other operating systems. Since Arnie had faced the same dilemma of demand on multiple operating systems when he was with CA Technologies, he already had the solution. 
The Zeek software was soon upgraded to include program code very similar to that of the CA Technologies adapter code. In fact, 30% of the new Zeek code was identical to the original adapter code. By 1988, CA Technologies had discovered this and filed suit against Altai for trade secret misappropriation and copyright infringement. As a response to the lawsuit, Altai created a clean room to rewrite the copied portions of the adapter code with programmers who had no prior knowledge to it. If you've ever seen the show Halt and Catch Fire, it was very much like this. You tell the boys at Boca Raton they've written a nice bios here. It'll be tough to beat. But rest assured, ours will contain no copyrighted material. Cameron Howe will be completely isolated in a clean room environment. She'll have no contact with Gordon Clark or his reverse engineering work. Any similarities in the code will be completely coincidental. Just like Columbia Data. Just like Compaq. Why are you two still in the same room? No, from here on in, we do this thing above board to the letter of the law. And that means you two don't so much as smile at each other on your way to the ladies' room. Get her out of here. Welcome to the clean room. So I have to stay here while you write the... The entire time? Yeah, I'm legally required to keep the clean room log. Maintain the Chinese wall between you and the Tainan engineers. What ultimately happened was the court found Altai guilty of copyright infringement, but not guilty on the charge of trade secret misappropriation, citing that the state law on trade secret claims was preempted by the Federal Copyright Act. The court also ruled the rewritten portion of the adapter code from the clean room did not violate any copyright. The issue with this specific court case was to determine how far copyrighted non-literal elements of software code goes. To determine whether the Altai's adapter, which they dubbed Oscar 3.5, was in violation of copyright, the court developed a three-point test. The Substantial Similarity Test for Computer Program Structure, which is what it is actually called, broke the alleged copy program into three parts, abstraction, filtration, and comparison. The abstraction process examines the actual program's code and what the program's ultimate function is. The filtration process examines the structural components at each level of abstraction and determines whether or not a specific piece of code was necessary for functionality or if it was even necessary for the software to run. An example would be how Webster's Dictionary includes made-up words only they know about. And when a competing dictionary includes those made-up words, they know the dictionary was copied. And for the third and final step, comparison, the court looks to see if there is any form of protectable expression and whether that protectable expression was in fact copied. Going back to Nintendo vs. Tengen. After Tengen tricked the patent office into giving Nintendo a secret lockout chip and releasing a slew of unlicensed games with it, Nintendo promptly sued them for copyright infringement. To determine whether Tengen had actually violated Nintendo's copyrights, the court used the exact same method of abstraction, filtration, and comparison. And what the court determined was the lockout chip's key was generated by a data stream and that that data stream was a creative expression protected by copyright. In fact, the court determined the very idea of the data stream to use as a key was unique enough that the idea itself was protected by copyright. To make matters worse for Tengen, the fact that Rabbit clone included identical program code not necessary for its function proved beyond reason of a doubt that it was in fact a verbatim copy. Tengen argued they left the extra program code intact as a precaution to damaging the NES consoles and to ensure future compatibility. The death nail for Tengen was the fact they used deceptive means to obtain the patented information. The only good news for Tengen came when the court ruled Nintendo's practices were a misuse of the copyright system by maintaining a monopoly of NES-compatible cartridges by the restrictive use of the lockout system itself. However, since Tengen did not create a key with clean hands and did not act in good faith with obtaining the patented information, the court sided with Nintendo. If Tengen had actually been successful in reverse engineering the chip, would that have made a difference? Well, in another case, Bowers vs. Base State Technologies, the court ruled that reverse engineering is considered fair use and that the fair use defense is even necessary so that copyright protection does not extend to ideas embodied in works. And in Sega vs. Accolade, the courts also ruled that reverse engineering doesn't violate copyright laws when done so in good faith and without resorting to the same tactics Tengen used to obtain patented information. And the lawsuit against Tengen's rabbit wasn't the only legal hurdle the company faced. On April 6, 1989, Nintendo announced it was going to release the first ever video game developed in the Soviet Union. Stay over. 
The game Slated was a puzzle-like game that had already been a huge success throughout both the Soviet Union and the United States, selling more than 100,000 units for computers in the U.S. alone. This new game, Tetris, would be available to consumers by the end of the year. However, when Tengen heard about this, they thought the whole thing seemed odd, especially since they had already acquired an exclusive license to distribute the hit Soviet Union game Tetris in the United States. Tengen got their legal team prepared for another lawsuit against the gaming giant. Nintendo claimed they had entered into an exclusive international agreement themselves to distribute Tetris with Electron Org Technica, the Soviet Foreign Trade Association. Electron Org Technica, or ELORG as they were better known as, was the Soviet state-controlled importer and exporter of computer hardware and software in the Soviet Union. Because Tetris was developed at the Soviet Academy of Sciences, the state actually owned rights to the game. Within two weeks of Nintendo's announcement, Tengen filed suit against Nintendo, claiming they had actually acquired exclusive international rights to manufacture and distribute Tetris on numerous gaming systems, including the NES, through a deal with Mirosoft in May of 1988. In June of 1989, the court issued a preliminary injunction against Tengen, instructing them that they were not to distribute their version of Tetris for the NES console. The reasoning behind the injunction involved the fact that Tengen had obtained their license to manufacture and distribute Tetris through Mirosoft, a British company who had only obtained a license to distribute a computer version of the game, while Nintendo had successfully negotiated directly with Elorg, the Soviet state-run agency who actually owned the rights to the game. The trial that was set to begin on November 13th was ultimately cancelled and the court ruled in favor of Nintendo, citing that Tengen did not properly secure rights to the Tetris game. Mirosoft did not have the proper authority to grant those rights, so their contract was invalid. The court ordered all of Tengen's versions of Tetris destroyed. While down, Tengen was certainly not out. At least not yet. They continued developing both coin-operated arcade titles, as well as titles for other consoles, such as the Atari Lynx which was manufactured by its Siamese twin, Atari Corporation. In June of 1990, Atari Games announced it would repurchase the entire 43.8% share of the company owned by Namco America, who happened to be one of Atari Games' two largest shareholders outside the company. In return, Namco would receive ownership of Atari Games' Atari Operations subsidiary, which operated approximately 40 video game arcades, mostly in the western and southeastern United States. The transaction was estimated at around $20 million. The deal left Time Warner from having a 40% stake in the company to about an 80% stake. In March of 1991, the U.S. District Court granted Nintendo a preliminary injunction against Tengen and ordered Tengen to stop manufacturing, distributing, and marketing all of its NES titles. The court also ordered a recall of all unlicensed NES games developed by Tengen. Tengen appealed the court's decision and won an appeal after threatening layoffs and even shutting down the entire company due to the financial strain the injunction imposed. In October of 1991, Tengen struck a deal with Sega to manufacture and distribute more than 40 titles for Sega in the North American and European markets for Sega's Master System, the Game Gear, the Genesis, or Mega Drive as it was known outside the U.S., plus titles for the not-yet-released Sega CD system. In September of 1992, the Federal Court of Appeals ruled that while reverse engineering as a practice is a legitimate business move, Tengen was to cease manufacturing and distributing unlicensed NES games something the lower court had also ruled on. While things had not been going well in the courts for Tengen, in November of 1992, their luck changed. Breakout had been created by Atari in 1975 and released in 1976. Atari Games had sought to formally register Breakout with the U.S. Copyright Office on February 6, 1987, but the Copyright Office refused to register the copyright on the basis that the work did not contain at least a minimum amount of original pictorial or graphic authorship or authorship and sounds. Atari Games' move to register Breakout with the Copyright Office was necessitated by their legal action for copyright infringement against Romstar for their 1986 Breakout-like arcade game Arkanoid by Taytu. In November of 1992, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit reversed a trial judge's ruling against Atari Games and said the Copyright Office had lacked a rational basis for refusing to issue a copyright for the game Breakout to Atari Games. In Atari Games Core vs. Omen, the court originally ruled in favor of Omen, but in the Court of Appeals, Atari was successful. The appeals court determined that the Copyright Office was wrong to not issue copyright for the game Breakout when Atari had originally applied for it in 1976. Even though the game itself is simple, especially compared to much more complex games of today, 
Even a game with that simplicity is entitled to copyright protection. That's because even Breakout possesses a requisite of creativity on a fixed medium. The appeals court cited the case of Feist Publications versus Rural Telephone Service, which dealt with defining what can and cannot be copyrighted by declaring information alone without a minimum of original and creativity cannot be protected by copyright. By this point, Atari Games has spent the better part of a decade redefining its identity through their subsidiary Tengen. It was made up of many of the same programmers that made Atari the household name that it was. After losing their dominance in an industry they basically created, they fought and lost with the Goliath that had replaced them at the top of the home gaming market. By 1994, many of the programmers and managers had left Tengen. The general who became a slave. The slave who became a gladiator. The gladiator who defied an emperor. A striking story. Now that people want to know how the story ends. On April 11, 1994, Time Warner Interactive Group, Atari Games, and Tengen announced they would integrate the three companies into what would be called Time Warner Interactive. They also said the integration move wouldn't cause any layoffs amongst the 200 plus employees. Any future games would be released under the new Time Warner Interactive brand. And just like that, the rebel company known as Tengen would be no more. What impact did Tengen and Atari Games have on the gaming market? Well, while their cutthroat tactics would be unadvisable, they did force the legal system to determine how even simple games like Breakout are protected under copyright law, as well as the legitimate and illegitimate use of reverse engineering. The story of Tengen is one of revenge. Not exactly a David vs. Goliath saga, more like a wounded Goliath going up against the new Goliath on the block. Atari had helped build from scratch the home gaming industry as we know it and after some poor business decisions kicked Atari out of consumers' homes and had brought Nintendo in as their replacement, Atari created Tengen as a means to gain back what was at one time rightfully theirs. In the end, Atari's attempt at getting back into consumers' homes failed, but their presence is still felt today, both in the gaming industry and in the court system. And don't forget, Atari created the industry that Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft currently occupy. Well, that is it for this episode of The Bearded Nerd. Thanks for watching. Click the subscribe button to keep up with future videos and feel free to write hateful comments below. See you next time.